Well, I want to welcome the folks that are joining us online. Uh, we're starting our service a bit late just because we had some uh, copyrighted material that we were using for our uh, music this morning and so that's why the live stream started a little bit later than normal but now we get to have some music that is a full live performance as Pat joins us uh, with her auto harp and she and Charity uh, sing a uh, very beloved classic song for us. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below start out by giving you guys a little bit of a quiz. I'm going to put up in uh, some song titles, but I'm going to do them as though they were newspaper headlines, okay? So if you were to, uh, these will be familiar songs to you, okay? Ones that you probably most of you will recognize uh, the song, maybe not by its, its title, but see if you can figure out what song it's talking about when we, um, when we put up the title. So let's go ahead and put up our first one for us here. I'm going to stand over on this side. Storm sinks ship on Lake Superior. Can you guys think of what song this would be referencing? Go ahead and shout it out if you know. The Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. If you guys have heard that song, it's a song from, from quite a while ago. Okay, let's go with the next one here. Man with odd name confronts his father. Boy named Sue. Boy named Sue. Right, okay. Yeah, but Johnny Cash. All right, next one here. Rodent transforms Southern Congregation. The, the Mississippi Squirrel Revival, yeah, or The Day the Squirrel Went Berserk. People used it, yeah, by Ray Stevens. Okay, for those of you who've heard that, a very funny song. All right, next one here. Poker player dies in rail car. The Gambler, yes, yeah. Yep, Kenny Rogers, okay. Ne next one here, okay. Third, uh, timid man avenges wife in bar fight. 
Coward of the county, also Kenny Rogers, right. Very good. Boy, you're, you're rocking this here. Very good. All right, Franklin's nailing these things. All right, here's another one here. Miner saves coworkers from cave-in. Big John, or Big Bad John, yeah, by uh, Jim, Jimmy Dean. All right, now here's another one. Appalachian family finds riches on homestead. Beverly Hillbillies, but that's not actually the title of the song. The title is The Ballad of Jed Clampett. Okay, I put up there the artist, which was Flat and Scruggs, but it was actually written by a guy by the last name of Henning. Okay, now I saved that one for last specifically because it uses a term in the title of the song. Every one of these songs that we've talked about this morning is what is called a ballad. A ballad is a song that tells a story. A story of an individual, a story of a group, a story of an event in history. Okay, is a ballad. Now, some songs, you know, celebrate all kinds of different, you know, feelings, emotions, events, whatever. But this, specifically a ballad, is a song that tells a story. This morning, we are going to be in Judges chapter 4 and 5. You can begin turning there in your Bible. Some of the verses will be on the screen, but I'm not putting the entire of both chapters up there. It's too long to do so. We're not going to read everything, but I want you to have the context. So if you can have your Bibles open, that will be helpful. Now, the difference between chapter 4 and chapter 5 is the difference between the two lines that I had for each of those slides. Okay, the top line was like the newspaper headline. That's chapter 4. Chapter 4 is narrative, it's prose, it's like a newspaper report or a magazine article that tells a particular story. Chapter 5 is the ballad. It is a song, a poetic way of expressing the exact same thing. So it's the same story told two different ways. Both of them are accurate, both of them are, are truthful, but they're going to look a little different. We're going to spend most of our time in chapter 4, and I'm not going to sing chapter 5, don't worry. But we are going to reference a few things from chapter 5 because the song actually fills in a few details that we are missing from chapter 4. Now, that was just setting the context for kind of like what we're going to be looking at, but that's not the lesson that we're going to get. The lesson that we are going to get is about the call of God. When God calls you, how are you going to respond? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at two different guys and we're going to look at two different ladies and how their story weaves together, but this is all teaching us one lesson, and that is how are you going to respond when you hear the call of God? Now, when I hear, say the call of God, don't think necessarily just the call of God as in he's calling me to go someplace. I mean, that could be, but when you hear a word from the Lord, a message from the Lord, how are you going to respond? When God says, I want you to do, stop, do, go, stay, return, you can fill in the blank with what verb God's going to put in there for you that he wants you to do. How are you going to respond when God calls? Okay, so now let's go ahead and start. We're going to start in chapter 4. I'm going to probably be a little more dependent on my notes this morning than I normally am. Um, chapter 4, and I want to read to you verses 1 through 3. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. The sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 40 years. Now, if you remember last week, uh, we talked about this cycle that is repeated in Judges. Uh, the first step in the cycle, which we have on a diagram up here, is when Israel sins. Israel is sinning, and then God sells his people or hands them over to a foreign oppressor who, who treats them severely. And then step three is the people cry out to God for help. That's what we just covered here in verses 1 through 3, is those first three steps in that cycle. Um, now, to get a feel for what the, parent, the people are experiencing, it talks about how they were oppressed, but we don't really get a feel for what that emotionally feels like in chapter 4. But now let's look at chapter 5, and I want to get a couple of verses here that are going to tell you a little bit more of the situation. This is chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. The travelers went by roundabout ways, and the peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel. Until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen. Then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Now, this tells you a little bit of what it was like. People were fearful of going out of their homes. If they're going to travel, they're not taking the main roads. They're going to go by the side roads and other places where they... Um, they're less likely to be seen. 
It says the peasantry see, so people may have been even afraid to go out and to tend their animals and farm their fields because these enemy oppressors were around. You guys have probably heard stories of uh, war-torn countries and people are afraid of the soldiers. They're afraid to go out and get groceries or go visit anybody. They just have to stay hunkered down in their homes. That's the situation here. And it also says that new gods were chosen. Remember Israel, their sin was often idolatry. New gods were chosen. It brought war to the gates. War has come to us. And then it says, not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 people in Israel. Now, whether this is because Israel was at peace and so they had just kind of let their weapons fall into disrepair or lost them or anything, or whether like the Philistines had done at times where they came in and they said, okay, we're going to take the blacksmiths away from you. We're going to take your weapons away. So basically you're an unarmed people and we can oppress you. We don't know what the situation was except for the fact that the Israelites had very little in the way of weaponry to defend themselves. So we see that by filling in the details from the ballad into, into the situation. So um, it was a dire situation, and these were the conditions that caused the Israelites to cry out to God. And that brings us to the fourth stage in the cycle, which is where God raises up a deliverer to rescue them. And this deliverer in the book of Judges is called a judge. Now, we often think of a judge as a person in a black robe with a gavel. Well, in, in the book of Judges, that term is really more for a deliverer, usually in the form of a military leader. But the person gained enough respect uh, from the people that they often governed the people as well. Now, um, in this particular situation, we're going to see that there's actually a couple of different people that together serve in this role of judge. The military leader and the, the governing leadership kind of combined together. So now let's go back to Judges 4, Judges 4 verses 4 and 5. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramath and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, so she serves in a similar fa fashion to what our judges do today. So a person who will decide cases amongst people. Now, this was uncommon in Israel's history for a woman to have this level of authority. Um, usually that was something that was just reserved uh, for the men. And last week we saw three different men that God raised up as judges to deliver Israel. But here we see this rule divided between her and the person we're now going to meet in verse 6. Now she, Deborah, sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and she said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. So here we're introduced to the person that God has chosen as a deliverer, the military portion of this leadership role. And his name is Barak, okay, or Barak. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it. I'm going to call him Barak. Um, and victory was assured for him. God says, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, it's a dangerous task, but it is uh, one that if he's successful is going to gain him you know, great honor. Of course, the Lord gets the honor, but he's going to be honored along with the Lord in that because the victory was assured. And so along the way this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some little points to remember about when God calls you and how we're to respond. Now, this is the first one, is that God's call is clear. God's call is clear. There are times when we may be a little uncertain on what God wants us to do, but there's always things that are certain about what God wants us to do. And here, there's no ambiguity. God is calling him to go. He tells him where to go, whom to approach, how to, you know, whom to recruit, how many people. He explains how the enemy is going to respond to their movement. So he's actually got um, intelligence and orders, even a promised outcome. And so you think Barak is going to jump at this opportunity, right? But keep in mind the enemy he's facing. It talked about this guy who had these uh, 900 iron chariots, right? Now this is, historically speaking, this is the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. So iron chariots was a step up technologically. Um, Israeli, the Israelites were primarily an infantry kind of army. They're marching soldiers. And so this would be like an armored division coming up against the infantry, to put it in our modern terms. And these iron chariots, one of the commentaries I read, uh, if you guys remember the movie Ben-Hur, okay, some of those chariots had these spikes sticking out of their wheels, like little swords or knives. And so as that wheel is turning really fast, it's like a blender. And so if you can imagine 900 armored chariots with 
knives sticking out of the wheels, if they're going to go into the infantry, they're just going to mow them down like a, like a farmer with a bush hog taking down weeds. And so this is a, an intimidating situation for Barak to say, I, I'm, I'm going go to go to do what? What do you want me to do? And so he was faced with the decision. Am I going to focus on God or am I going to focus on my enemy? Am I going to focus on the Lord or the weapons? You know, it, what God has said or what I'm seeing before me here. Uh, now, did you notice how God's message was prefaced um, back in verse 6? It doesn't say, the Lord is asking you, Barak, are you willing? The Lord is looking for a volunteer to step forward. That's not what it says. God has commanded you. This is what you are to do. The word of the Lord through Deborah, the prophetess, they knew that she spoke for God. This is what I'm calling you to do. You need to go do it. Now, before we look at Barak's response, let's consider some of the commands that God's given us. You know, God commands us to give and to give generously, give sacrificially. God calls us to go make disciples of all nations, to forgive one another. He calls us to love as I have loved you. And sometimes those things can seem about as intimidating as what Barak's called to do here. You know, sometimes God calls us to, to go to a foreign mission field or to step across a boundary and share the gospel with somebody. All of these things can be intimidating to us to various degrees. And so how Barak responds is going to be kind of instructive for us a little bit on how to respond or maybe even how not to respond. Okay, so let's look at his response now in uh, verse 8. Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you won't go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So these verses are key to understanding the story, the account this morning. Um, so look closely at all that we've read so far and kind of take it and package it together. God had promised victory to Barak, right? And, uh, but he is not comfortable going on just God's word. He wants to have God's messenger, the representative of God's presence. He wants Deborah uh, to go with him. Now, we're not told why this is. Does he think he'll have to inquire of the Lord while he's out in the midst of this? Does he think that maybe the army won't come to him unless they see this respected figure beside him? We don't know, but we know that in his situation, the word of the Lord was not enough for him. He said, I need something else. I need that human element um, present as well. He was putting preconditions on it. So by not doing so, he forfeited a measure of the blessing that God would have otherwise given him. So even without finishing the story here, there's a couple of gems that we can mine from what we've read so far. The greatest blessing comes from complete trust in the word of God. The greatest blessing. There might be other blessings alongside, but the greatest blessing comes from complete trust in God's word. Now, Barak was blessed to be called by God, and he was blessed with the assurance of victory. Um, and he would have been blessed with honor when God accomplished the victory. And we're going to see that the first two blessings came to pass, but the last was forfeited because he didn't take God at his word fully. Now, I don't know about you, I don't want to miss any of the blessings God has for me. You know, if God has promised me three blessings, I don't want to settle for just two. You know, I want to get the most blessing that I can from God. So I'm try I tried to think through what are some scenarios where I might be tempted to compromise and do things less than God wants me to or do them in a way that's not quite the way that God said, kind of going less than 100% with the Lord. So let's say that my family has planned a vacation, and, uh, but then we hear about a missionary overseas or a ministry outreach that's really in need, and we're like, kind of feeling this tug on our hearts that maybe we should give our money that we had set aside for this to this other cause. And we're feeling that that's what the Lord's calling us to do. Well, could we, should we give it all to meet that full need? Or would it be like, well, okay, let's just take a two-day vacation instead of a four-day vacation, and we'll kind of help with the need but not help all of it. You know, and not that that's a sin to do so, but if God's calling you to do one thing and you do the other, then it is a sin, Right? Um, or God calls me to volunteer in a ministry or a community endeavor, and I think, that's great. I really do want to support that, but I'm going to write a check to that instead, and I'm, I don't want to actually show up and get my hands dirty. And Maybe there's a blessing that God has for me in a relationship, a person he was going to bring across my path, and I'm going to forfeit that blessing because of the fact that I didn't want to actually participate in the ministry. I just give money. Because for some of us, 
we've got a lot more time than we have money. Some of us have more money than we have time. And so we're willing to sacrifice the thing we have a lot of, but not the thing that's a little bit more precious to us, right? So I'm just, just a couple possibilities, and I don't know what call that God has placed on your life, what thing he is telling you to do, but don't stop short of the full blessing that God wants to give you. Um, another principle to remember is that God's plans don't need our modification. Another way you could put this is that God's word doesn't need an editor. You know, if God said it the way he said it, that should be enough. I shouldn't have to go in with my little red pen and, and edit out the parts that I don't like and say, I'm going to add in this and, and make this a little bit different. So let's go back to the story, though. Barak assembles uh, his troops in, in verse 10, and let's now jump to verse 12. Then they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera called together all his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him, from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all the army with the edge of the sword before Barak, and Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not even one of them was left. Now, I don't know if this is the spot that I had the picture of Mount Tabor in there, but if you've, you might have seen that. It's, it's hard to drive a chariot on the side of a mountain. It doesn't work so well. So when they gathered at Mount Tabor, that was a safe position. But God says through Deborah, go on down. Go on down into the plains, the flat area, and go towards the river. And that's where I'm going to draw Sisera out to you. God had promised, I'm going to bring the enemy to you. You go out. But this was a dangerous situation for them. But the narrative gives us a basic outline of the victory, but the ballad paints this in a lot more vivid hues for us. So I want you to see something from uh, chapter 5 that will give us a little more insight into how this battle went down. Chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. The kings came and fought. They then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on with strength. Now, because this is poetry, you know, a song, this is a little hard to kind of navigate through, but I want to point out something here. That the stars were fighting. Nature was fighting against them. Something from up above was coming down on those below. And it talks about the, the river, the river torrent coming. Chariots are not ATVs. They don't work well in mud. You don't go mudding in a chariot, right? Those things are going to get caught. The wheels are narrow. And so if the Lord brings down rain and raises the river level, it's going to be a muddy, flat plain there. And there's no way that those chariots are going to operate. So the technology that Sisera apparently was depending on became useless because of what the Lord did. Can't always predict the way that God's going to do things, can we? And so the chariots became useless. The soldiers had to get out and fight, and Israel was able to rout them. It says that not a single one was left, except Sisera. He ran away, but we'll find out what happens to him in just a little while. From a human perspective, it looked like nature was fighting against them. Um, and this reminds us, this, the way this battle played out, we may not know how it will happen, but God will always keep his word. God is what I call the God of left field. You've heard, how, man, that came out of left field. I didn't expect that. God seems to me to take pleasure in doing things that we cannot have predicted, that we couldn't have expected to show how great he is. We might think, oh, God could come through in this way, or God could come through in that way, and then God does something clear out of the blue that we never expected. That's exactly what he does here. So we've seen how God kept his word on the victory. Now let's see how God kept his word regarding the matter of honor. See, when God said that a woman would get the honor, it would be natural for us, the readers, to assume, and natural for Barak to assume, Deborah's going to get the honor. Okay, she's this honored person among Israel, and she's helping me lead, so she's going to take the honor, but he goes ahead and goes forth and obeys what God says. Now look at verse 17. Now Sisera fled away on foot, on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera, and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me, don't be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little milk 
or excuse me, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink, and then she covered him. And he said to her, stand in the doorway of the tent, and if, it shall be that if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, is there anyone here, then you shall say no. Now we skipped it earlier in verse 11, but there was an explanation as to how the Kenites, Jael's clan here, were actually kind of distant relatives through marriage of the Israelites, uh, through Moses. And there was peace between this enemy group and the Kenites, or at least Heber's group here. And so it seems that though they should have been allied with Israel, Jael's clan was actually maybe allied with the, the ruling power of the day, with, with Sisera's group. And so maybe they were even traitors against Israel. Um, so we're kind of left hanging right here. Okay, well, she has now hidden him. He seems safe. Is Barak going to be able to find him? Is Barak going to be able to, to strike down vengeance on this guy? Okay, well, let's pick it up in verse 21 now. But Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg, seized a hammer in her hand, and went in secretly and drove the peg into his temple. And it went in through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted. And so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said, Come, I'll show you the man you're seeking. And he entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. To quote one of our, uh, a line from one of the movies that we enjoy, twist ending. You didn't expect that, right? That, that this guy was going to die at the hand of this woman, okay? And not even Deborah. This is like a, a common woman, apparently. And she's alone, and she does it without a weapon. She just improvises with what she has and takes this guy out. Did not expect that coming. See, the honor of killing Sisera, the enemy commander, didn't go to Barak, didn't even go to Deborah, and went to Jael. God bringing something out of left field. And so this reminds us of something we learned last week, is that God uses unlikely people and unconventional weapons to accomplish unparalleled results. God does it his own way, and usually in a way that is really going to surprise us. Now, on this matter of honor, I want to take one last listen in on the ballad. Um, if you read through the entirety of chapter 4, you're going to see that Barak gets only two mentions, two little tiny mentions in the whole of chapter 5, all, I think, 31 verses of it. Deborah gets a little bit more airtime, but still not a lot. But Jael has an entire verse of the song, which is four verses in our Bibles, devoted to her. Let's read those. This is uh, 524. Most blessed of women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked her for water. She gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera. She smashed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet he bowed, he fell. And where he bowed, there he lay dead. Not the sort of song that you sing to your kids at bedtime, you know. It's, it's kind of gory, but yet she has this entire portion of the song memorialized, you know, for, for all time to celebrate what she did. She gained more honor than Barak. And why? Barak forfeited the honor because he was not willing to put his full reliance on just the word of the Lord. Now, we know that he was a man of faith. He's commended for his faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I think it's verse 32, um, where it talks about how he was a man of faith. And we see that he did step forward and do what God called him to do, but he forfeited that extra measure of blessing because he didn't just solely depend on the word of the Lord. He wanted to have that human element along with him to help him out, to boost up his courage. So as we zoom out and take in both of these chapters with a wide-angle lens, I want you to look at the lessons that we have uh, saw along the way and then look at what is our response to God's message as well. So uh, here's a couple of kind of condensing these lessons down. When God calls you, obey without preconditions. Obey without preconditions. You remember when Jesus was calling some people to follow him, and a couple of those said, oh, well, I'll follow you, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Oh, I'll follow you, but first let me go back and bury my father. And Jesus says, no, when I call, come, leave behind everything else. We need to not put conditions on answering God's call. When God gives you a plan, don't modify it. Just work God's plan rather than trying to rework God's plan. Trust God to keep his word completely, even if you don't know how he is going to do it. 
chances are he's going to surprise you somewhere along the way. And let God use you, weak and lacking though you may feel, to accomplish his word and his will. So as we close this out, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you to think of what is the calling that God has on you. Now, some people have a big life calling for something grand, but along the way, God gives us a lot of smaller callings as well. What has God been speaking to your heart this week? In your times of prayer, your times in scripture, maybe the time that he has tugged on your heart as you have seen a situation and you feel like, I think God's calling me to go engage with that person across the street or this person across the office. Or maybe there is a call that God placed on your life a while back and you've kind of just ignored it. I'm going to put that on the shelf. I'm not going to disobey God, but I'm not going to really embrace that thing right now and and act on it. Again, this could be something of sharing the gospel with another person. Could be a level of sacrifice that he's calling you to. Could be a level of faith. He's saying, I want you to step out and attempt this thing you don't think you can do, but I'm calling you to do it, so go ahead and step forward. And what I'd like you to do is, you know, in a piece of paper, on your hand, the margin of your Bible, write down, God called me to do, or God is calling me to, and you fill in the blank with that. And I'd encourage you to put a date by it, because dates tend to give us two things. It gives us some accountability for doing something about it. It also gives us an anchor for memory. So when you turn to that two, three years later, you can say, wow, this is what God called me to do. And I can see how I have obeyed or see how I have not obeyed yet. But what I, one of the things that God's been convicting me on this week is don't give some big grandiose plan. Um, you know, if, like when I'm teaching somebody or when I'm trying to look at what am I going to do with my life, don't look so much big. Look at what can I obey right now? What can I do this afternoon? What can I do this week? Who can I share the gospel with? So what I encourage you to do, don't leave this morning without writing down, this is, as far as I know, what God is calling me to do. And then, are you going to obey fully? Are you going to engage without preconditions? Are you going to just step forward and I'm going to do it? So that's, what, uh, that's, that's the message for this morning. Now, I just realized about five minutes into my message, I totally forgot to pray. Usually I do that. You know, I have a, a time of prayer. So that's what we're going to actually end with now before we have our closing song uh, of invitation. Just because Pastor spaced it this morning and I forgot. So we definitely need to spend some time in prayer. So I'm going to get out my pen here and my paper. And I would love to know from you guys, um, how can we be praying for each other? this week? What's on your hearts? Either what has God done or what are we asking God to do? Uh, I'll tell you, Mary Toll said that she's still having a lot of problems with her swallowing. So be praying for her. She's, uh, it's just very difficult uh, for her to eat right now. Uh, so please be in prayer for her. And uh, Daryl shared also that his son-in-law's mom, I think it is, I can't remember, Geraldine is her name, but she's recovering from both, I believe it's a stroke and also from COVID. So uh, she is recovering, which is the good news, but uh, be praying for Geraldine as well. So are there other um, prayer points that you have to to share with us this morning? All right. Well, let me close us in uh, prayer here, also closing out our message with prayer. And then after that, we do have one more song um, that, that we will sing. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, I am thankful that you have led us through your word this morning. And I pray, Father, that you would drive this home into our hearts. Um, I know you are working on me through this, and just that there are, particularly in sharing the gospel with others, that's, I think, my area of obedience, to step forward and to do. Uh, There are others as well, but I pray for each of us that this would, we would know God's calling me to this, and that we would not forfeit any of the blessing that you want to give us along the way. Lord, we'd lift up to you Mary And I pray that you would open up her her ability to eat and to swallow and to gain the nourishment she needs without pain. Lord, we also pray for um, Geraldine and for her continued healing and also for uh, Glenn Pointer and his uh, healing from this COVID. Uh, Thank you that they are receiving the care they need and and are uh, recovering. Lord, we pray for the McIntyres. We celebrate with them and thank you for 50 years of marriage. And I pray that their time away of celebrating together would be super sweet for them. 
that you would keep them safe. We also pray for uh, Sarah and Tim, that their time away would be a great blessing to them as they tour the coast and that it would be a refreshing time as a couple. I also pray for my friend Brian and his wife Amy as Brian has stage four cancer. And um, I pray that you would give them very clear guidance as to what is the right path for them to take. And Lord, I pray that you would bring healing um, to him from this. I also pray for Amanda, that you would heal her of the MS, and that she would be free to serve you more fully uh, with just the, the activities of life and, and what her body can do. Lord, take us forth from here, uh, glorifying you, praising you, focused on you, and in a world that is in so desperate need of hearing you, of, of knowing who you are, I pray that we would be a bright light and witness, and that we would be a, an example of peace in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name, amen.